Thank you. Um, good afternoon. It is really good to be here. I started my very first job while I was in college um, on North First Street. Uh, so I feel a little bit like I'm, I'm come home, but I don't feel any younger <laughs> at all. Um, so who here has heard the, the saying, knowledge is power? Yeah, we've almost all of us heard it. I, today, I want to make a case, um, not for knowledge is power, but that there perhaps is more power and more innovation that comes from not knowing. And that in some ways, that knowledge is dangerous. So I, I want to make a case for ignorance, not as in lack of education or stupidity, not that kind of ignorance, but I want to make a case for a lack of certainty. And ask really, is it possible that we do our best thinking and our most innovative work when we're learning, when we're uncertain, when we don't actually know? I'm sorry, he was valid, invalid enough to That's all right, that's all right. I, I thought it was, I'm sorry, I don't agree with that point. <laughs> um, and I'm like, oh, the resistance starts very early here. Um, so I want to start our conversation. It's going to be a conversation meaning where we're going to pull who are people who are on WebEx and I, I, I'm going to encourage you to, to join in, shout out. Don't wait for questions till the end. Join in. Uh, but I want to start our conversation with a very, um, very, very simple scenario, a very typical scenario and a simple one. It's also at a global technology company, a big uh, consumer and enterprise uh, software company. I want to start with a very typical scenario that happens all the time, and this is a scenario that happens all the time, the whole redial into the conference call. So here's the scenario. It, we see it a lot, the department offsite, the planning session. Um, so at this global software company, um, the head of the, the sales readiness department pulls his team offsite for a planning session. Now they're a well-funded group. They've got a multi-million dollar budget. They've got about 140 people in this group. Their job, they're part of the product division for this global software company, and their job is that when a new product rolls out the door, they're to make sure the sales force can sell it, ready to go. Some of you might work in a readiness uh, product function here. The company is, is trying to radically rethink the way that they go to market. Instead of going to market on a product feature basis, maybe going to market around line of business, what people are actually doing with their, their software, which is causing this team to have to really rethink their work and their business. Um, Chris, who leads this team, he's a really bold thinker and an innovator. He takes his team offsite with two objectives. Number one, rethink if not radically rethink the work that we're doing to support this change in, in direction for the business. And number two, get clear on our priorities for the next six months. It's a pretty typical kind of offsite off setting. This group is comprised of a set of training professionals who are like veterans at this. They've been in training and enablement and sales readiness for years. And then there's a couple newcomers to the group, people who have been out in sales roles or product roles, but if now kind of doing a rotation on this readiness team, he pulls this team offsite, kind of lays out his priorities for rethinking this change in the company, and then every, every person in this offsite, every department manager has been given a task, and that is to come up with a stretch challenge, some big question that will help them rethink and focus their energy, something that's bold, but a bite-sized thing, an experiment, so that every group has one of these. I sat in this meeting, and let me tell you what I saw. Um, it started with the veteran staffers. The first one, when it came time for her big stretch challenge for her team, she actually ignored Chris's list of priorities and said, you know, I actually figured I understood better what needed to be done. And then she delivered a stretch challenge for her team that looked just like the status quo, what they had always been doing. The second person said, okay, I'm gonna come up with some big lofty goal. And the reaction on, of everyone on the team was, wow, that just sounds like what we've always been trying to do but consistently fail at. 
And they said, could you make that smaller, like something we can experiment, something fresher and newer? And as the team started to give him feedback, trying to help him refocus his team's effort, he finally just said, I'm really uncomfortable with other people giving me input. I just, I need to think about this offline. The third person said, you know, I think we can, we can radically shift our strategy and, and, and implement all of this in an online training approach, which sounded great, it sounded new and innovative. And then when people on the team asked him, how are you gonna get senior executive support for this? This innovation, this radical uh, change in direction, he said, oh, I'm not gonna involve the executives. He said, I've learned over the years to keep executives out of things. I know best. He said, in fact, I really only ask the executives for their opinion on issues that don't really matter very much. All three of them had failed at this task of coming up with an innovative, big challenge for their group. Yet, the newcomers didn't seem to fall into that trap. The first newcomer, she was brand new to this function. She'd been in the job three weeks. When she was told she would have to come up with a stretch challenge for her team, she said, whoa, I have no idea how to do this. I'm brand new to this. She went away, came back after the designated time, laid out her stretch challenge for the rest of the team, people were blown away. It was fresh, it was bite-sized, it was energetic, it exactly aligned with the new priorities and the shift the company was going through. They're like, wow, pretty good for a newbie. The second person who was new to this function, she offered her stretch challenge. It was good, but not great. You know, the team said, okay, you're kind of getting there. So on the break, she came back to the, the leader and said, okay, what do I do about this and how do I think about that? And she got feedback and she listened, she reworked it, came back with a stretch challenge for the team that absolutely nailed it. Chris, the general manager of this, this team, he said, wow, it seems like the more you know, the harder this is to do. And so that's the question I wanna ask in our conversation. When we are asked to think innovatively, to do something different. Can, can knowledge be a burden? And is it possible that we're actually at our best and our most innovative when we're new and when we're naive and when we're in this space of learning? And that's really the question I want to explore. I want to explore today six keys to unlock innovative thinking. What I hope is that as we conclude our time together, as we come up on the hour, that you will walk away with six things that you could do to breathe more innovation into your thinking and into your work and into your products. And of these six things, my hope is that everyone just picks one thing that might be useful for you. I, I want to start with the traps, the traps that we have to unlock. These are all knowledge traps. How does our knowledge get in our way? The first might be the expert trap. We find that there's a lot of leaders who are operating in a space assuming that their job is to have answers, to tell people what to do, to be the expert and to direct their team, but often so focused on their job of telling and knowing that they overlook what other people on the team know. Using their own knowledge too heavily, perhaps they underutilize the capability of people around them. You know, can we get trapped by, by our own knowledge? I want to ask you to think about two different leaders. I spent a couple years researching this dynamic. I want you to scan back across your career. Could have been from your first job, just like my first job here on North First Street many years ago. It could be a recent job, and I want you to pick two different leaders or managers that you worked with. I want you to pick one around whom you were at your very, very best, your most innovative, your most capable. This is someone around whom problems got solved, things got accomplished, you're learning, you're growing. Can you scan back and pull the name of someone into your mind right now? Does everyone have one? I'm also gonna ask you to think about someone around whom you were at your least creative. Someone around whom you held back. 
you played it safe. You kind of stuck on a path of status quo. I call the first type of leader a multiplier. I call the second type of leader a diminisher. Because of the effect that they have on other people's intellect and capability and creativity. Okay, have you got one of each kind of manager? Okay, and now I'm gonna ask you um, four questions. The first is I want you to take a minute, uh, pull out a piece of paper or your digital device um, and, and record your answers. First question, what did your diminisher do? If I came to watch this manager at work one day, what would I notice he or she did? And would you write down one or two key words to capture what this leader did that caused you to hold back and play it safe and get stuck maybe in status quo thinking? And then the second question, how much intelligence did he or she get from you? I'm gonna ask you to quantify with a number between zero and 100, how much of your intellect, your know-how, your ideas, your creativity, was this leader getting access to? This is a tricky question, and let me explain why it's a tricky question. I'm not asking you how hard you were working. Have you ever had a job where you were working extremely hard and maybe even overworked, but yet at the very same time underutilized? Has anyone ever been overworked and underutilized? Yeah. yeah. And just for fun, what's it like to be overworked and underutilized? <laughs> it just sucks. I like it. It's just, it just sucks. So you know the difference. There's a lot of people who are really busy but secretly bored. Okay. So I'm going to ask you to put a number down. How much of your capability and brain power and intellect and creativity was this get leader getting based on the way he or she led? And if you'd put a number down between zero and 100, that would be great. And then I want you to do the same, two thing, uh, same thing for your multiplier leader, the leader who got your most innovative thinking, your best ideas, you at your fullest and your most creative. And what did this leader do? If you're in the room, if you could start writing down answers. Okay, and I am gonna come for you now. Um, what was not mentioned in my bio, in my spare time and just for fun, I teach an early morning a theology class for high school students. So I fear no one. I fear no one. I spend my mornings with high schoolers. You cannot hide from me. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to tell me what is it that this leader did that caused you to play it safe, get stuck in status quo, not make progress. They, and, and, and I want you to, you don't need to raise your hand. We're not gonna come up to the microphones. We're going to practice the, the ancient art of shouting, okay? Okay, what is it that high school students tend to do? They, what is it they do? Everything. They do everything for you, good, keep going. They, micromanage. they micromanage, they, they bark orders, they, they stress, like they, they stress or they share stress. Yeah, they're like, um, have you seen the, the cartoon Peanuts with like Pigpen, the character who just carries this ball of dirt everywhere he goes and shares it with everyone? It's kind of like what they do, don't they? They, they, they share their stress with everyone around them. Okay, what else do these diminishing leaders tend to do? They, they fail to listen. They They patronize, they blame failure on others or external circumstances. They, they're, they're afraid. Yeah, they, and something from this group here, just to make me feel better. Yeah, they don't trust, they don't extend trust. And for my friends here, they, what do these leaders tend to do? like the way I just intimidated you trying to get you to say something. Maybe it, my inner diminisher came out. Okay, and what, what kind of effect do they have on other people? Why don't we take a sample here? Could, you, could we just go down this row and could you tell me what percentage of your capability did this diminishing leader get from you? Based on the way he or she was leading. Now, if you didn't write something down, just say pass, don't make it up. Um, can we start right here? 
20%. Is there someone in the room who will calculate an average of these numbers as they come out? I, I am pretty sure there are people in the room who can calculate this average. <laughs> okay, you've got it? Okay, 60, 20, 50, 40, 50, 50, 30, 30, 10, 50, 50, 40, Seven. <laughs> He's like, I want, like, what would it have taken to get 48? Okay, 47, 30, and 50. Okay. Um, while she's calculating an average of that, what is it that that leader believed to be true? What was the assumption that he or she was operating under? Okay, so the average is about 51%. Okay, get a second opinion on that number. When I, d I did this research, and I've done this over a massive amount of data points, we find that these diminishing leaders get less than half of people's capability. It's 48% is what came out of my global research. Okay, now you might ask yourself, how much of your intellect and your know-how and your creativity were you willing to give? Yeah, there's not a lot of variation in this data because what do you think that average is? It's just right around 100%. You know, I've studied leadership and I get to teach leadership all around the world and I'll tell you what I've learned about leadership is I've learned a lot about followership and contributorship and what I've learned, and it, this crosses industries and cultures, it is as true in Korea as it is in Silicon Valley, is that people come to work every day desperately wanting to give 100% of their capability, their best thinking and their best ideas. We don't want to hoard it. We want to share it. Okay, let's turn to the other leader, the leader who brought out your best thinking, your best ideas, your fullest capability. What did he or she do? They listen, they ask questions, they, they trust, they... They adapt some of the ideas. They, they, changed everything. they changed everything. Like they're willing to tear some things apart, and maybe even that are working to create something better. What else do these leaders that get your most innovative thinking tend to do? They're good teachers. They're, good teachers. they're open-minded. They motivate. They share ideas. Yeah, they know that in some ways knowledge is power. So they share it to give everyone else the raw ingredient they need for thinking and innovation and their best work. Any the truth. They, they, say the they say the truth. Like they speak the truth and they maybe speak truth to power. Okay, and how much of your capability do they get? Let's do the same row again. You guys like, well, we really tried to play it safe, not in the back, because you didn't get picked on in the back. We're definitely not sitting in the front. We're going to play it safe and sit in the middle, and yet she goes for the middle. 90? So we're going to go down the row and just share that percentage that this multiplier leader got from you. 80? 90? 90? 99? Ooh, he's like, I'm just going to hold back just a sliver. <laughs> just a sliver. 60? 92.76 sounds like a radio station. <laughs> 95? 90? 90? 90? 80? 95? 85? 95? 80. So, you know, that one we can probably approximate. It's a little bit of a tighter range. What would you say? Oh, 110, because a really good manager pulls things out of for me that I didn't even know I had. Well, okay, I still may say that's technically 100%, because you had it. 
But I've actually had people say, it's 120. And I'm like, no, it's not 120. You're just saying that it's 100. 100 is all of your ideas and capability and intellect. I'm pretty much sure that's all. <laughs> and I've been in arguments with people over this. They go, yeah, I hear you, Liz, 120%. <laughs> I'm like, no, you clearly didn't hear me, or you didn't take math in school. And, and I've had this argument with people. I finally lost the argument, because what I heard so many people say, they got things from me I didn't know they had. I'm like, good. And then they said, I grew so much working for this leader that the scale changed. I'm like, oh, that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, some leaders make us smarter and better. Um, we find this huge differential between these two leaders, whereas a lot of leaders are getting people's safest thinking and a fraction, maybe half of their capability, while other leaders seem to get virtually all of people's capability and then they grow it. And innovation happens around these leaders. Yes, thank you for jumping in. Yeah. Interesting. He's saying, I disagree with the 100% because what happens when people bring things from, from left field and other field? Yeah, I, I agree. I was wrong about this. And, and these leaders operate in a way that cause people to operate their fullest. They get that synergy effect on the team and they get contributions from people that they don't really know where they came from. Yeah, you do get this kind of a left field contribution. Some leaders are stuck in the expert trap, so fixated on what they know, what they're supposed to do, finding the answer, that innovation and contribution suffer around these kind of leaders. Jump in with a question. Okay, if that's the qu question, how do diminishers even become leaders? Why? I think we know the answer to that question in this room, don't we? A lot of times these diminishing leaders um, are there, they're put in these roles because they're smart and capable and innovative thinkers themselves. And it often takes us a while to realize that once we're in management, it's not about us anymore. For those of you who are in managerial roles, how long did it take you to figure this out? For me, it was at least six months and I feel like I need to constantly apologize to everyone who worked with me in those six months where I didn't realize that my job was to really pull the best thinking out of my team, not offer it myself. Some of these diminishing leaders end up staying in those positions because they actually look very good upwards into um, their bosses and their organizations. Um, and that's an interesting conversation. We, I'd love to talk with you more about that um, afterward. Okay, so this is the first trap, the trap of expertise feeling like you're supposed to have answers either because you're the boss or because you're the resident expert. Not realizing that your greatest impact probably comes from asking good questions rather than providing answers to the team. Or what about this next trap is the rut. Doing the same thing, walking a path you've walked before where you start to see what you expect to see often missing everything else. Um, is there someone with a nice, big, loud voice who can read this for us? It requires just basic literacy to do this job. Is there anyone who's willing to read this? Sure, why not? Okay, big, loud voice for us. It doesn't matter in what order the letters in a word appear. The only important thing is that the first and the last letter are in the right place. The rest can be a total mess, and you can still read it with wooden. Okay, very good, very good. He was making it all the way to the end. Okay, someone else back him up. That well done, by the way, on that. 
Who's got this one? Yeah, why is it with the letters out of place that we can still read this? Because it's similar enough to what we know that we fill in the blanks. And often we see a couple data points that look like something we already know, and we conclude, I got this, I've seen it, I know this problem, I understand this customer issue, I know exactly what I need to do to solve it. And we jump to conclusions. And we often completely miss. Or one of my favorite videos, I'm assuming most everyone has seen this video. Have you seen the video of the two teams, one in black, one in white, passing the basketball? Okay, a lot of you have seen it. For those of you who haven't, here's what I want you to do. I want you to count the number of passes, basketball passes, being made by the team wearing white. Okay, you're gonna see three people passing it around. Uh, you've got about 30 seconds to watch this, here you go. Count the passes. Okay, how many passes were there? 18, 17 and a half, 17 and a half passes. Okay, who saw the gorilla by raise of hands? He says, really, really. Okay, let's go back and let's look at it one more time. So this is some, from some research by Daniel Simons, um, I think at, Un at University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana, if I'm remembering uh, that right. It's on selective perception. People so focused on counting the passes made by the players in white miss <laughs> the gorilla that enters in. I mean, like, and for a fact, like, full on bangs his or her, I'm not so sure about that, chest and keeps moving. Why do we miss the gorilla? It seems in the research, 50% of the people miss the gorilla. Why do we miss the gorilla? Because we're looking at something else. Maybe so busy going after. And it's unimportant for the task at hand. It's unimportant for the task at hand. This happens all the time in technology and Silicon Valley. We're so busy optimizing a product, building out a certain set of features, focused on winning against a competitor that a gorilla comes into the market, an unimportant gorilla and just create something while we were looking somewhere else. I was the great philosopher Bono um, <laughs> who said sometimes the more you know the less you see. See we can be trapped by our knowledge, trapped in a tunnel focused on one thing and missing something of major importance that sweeps in. I want in our remaining time, and how much do we have? We've got about 20 minutes. Um, here's what I wanna do, six keys that will help us up the level of innovation in our thinking. Um, the first of these is to shift out of the mode of telling and operate in the mode of asking. The best leaders tell less and they ask more. And when they ask questions, they get more from people around them. The most creative people, the most innovative thinking doesn't come from facts and known assertions. It comes from what? A place of uncertainty, a problem you don't know how to solve, a question you're not sure you have the right answer to, or just an intellectually curious mind which we continue to see as one of the top traits of our most innovative thinker. I'm gonna encourage some of, uh, some of you might, if you wanna use this key to unlock more innovative thinking, I would encourage you to take what I call the extreme question challenge. It's simple in concept, I will admit it's a little bit hard to do, and the challenge is could you go into a meeting and commit yourself to only asking questions in that meeting? Now this could be a staff meeting, 
It could be an off-site planning meeting. It could be a one-on-one -on -one conversation where all you did was ask, has anyone ever tried to do this? Let me tell you about my first attempt at this. I've gotten better at it. Um, over the years, this was back in, in my days when I was at Oracle. I had a really big job at Oracle, and I had an even bigger job at home. I am the mom of four children, but this was 16 years ago where um, I didn't have four children. I just had three. It was a mere three. Uh, but they were six, four, and two years old. Is anyone, and so I was complaining about them, as is often the case with the 642 combo pack. Does anyone here have the 642 combo pack at your house or anything like that that would admit to it? What, um, so I was complaining, and I wasn't really complaining about my kids, I was complaining that I didn't feel like I was being a very good parent. I feel like I'm constantly telling my kids what to do, I'm like barking orders, like I am a little dictator in my house. And um, I told my buddy at work, Brian, I said, I feel like I've become the bossy mom. And Brian, who's very savvy, he said, Liz, you don't strike me as the bossy mom type. And I said, oh, let me explain this to you. And so what did I pick? I picked like a use case for him. What did I pick? If you've got 642 at home, bedtime. I picked bedtime. So I told him how bedtime went at our house. I was like, kids, kids, have her bed, put that away, leave her alone, get your pajamas on, go brush your teeth, go back, use toothpaste. Okay, story time, get a book. No, not five books, just one book, one book. No big books, no thick books. Get me like a little book about this big with like six pages of cardboard, thick cardboard, low word count. Okay, good, story time done. You know, say your prayers, get into bed, not her bed, out of my bed, back to bed. And, and those are so, so like, I don't want to mislead you, there's no yelling going on, it's just constant telling. And so Brian, completely overlooking the fact that this is recreational complaining at this point, he offers me some coaching. Now, I wasn't looking for coaching. What was I looking for? Sympathy. I was looking for sympathy, but I got some coaching, and his coaching was, Liz, why don't you try just asking them questions? He says, like, what if you just went home tonight and asked them nothing but questions? Seemed strange. Seemed weird. Like, I knew I was going to get home at 6, and they don't go to bed till like, 9.30, so that seemed like a really long time to be asking questions. But I decided to take this challenge, and I would encourage some of you to take it. And if you take this challenge, you go all the way, meaning nothing but questions. So that night, I get home, we get through dinner, we get through playtime afterward, and when it comes time for bed, I've got nothing but questions. What would your first question be? How was your day? How was your day? Okay, we're getting ready for bed. What kind of questions do you think I'm asking? <laughs> what time is it? And they're like, it's bedtime. See, they, they, were all, they had picked up on this pattern, like, you know, this whole idea of patterns. Like, we were going to the bed when it got dark. They went to bed, like the six-year-old had a lot of data points that said this, and, and they knew, they said bedtime. I said, okay, where do those toys need to go? Who's gonna be the first to get their teeth brushed? Who needs help getting your pajamas on? Um, who's gonna pick the story tonight? Whose turn is it to read the story? And that's, I think I pointed to my husband at that point. Um, and, and then I just, you know, the last question was, okay, who's ready for bed? And, and to my great surprise, they got in their beds, they stayed in their beds, and I'm left with nothing to do but to wonder, like, how long have they known how to do this? And what I learned is that when I asked the questions, it invited other people to find the answers and to take responsibility for getting things done. Um, maybe you take this challenge. I am not in any way suggesting that you operate permanently in this extreme question mode. It's creepy if you do this. <laughs> Your team will not appreciate it, but if you experiment with this, try it once, try it twice, you'll find that you become the spark of brilliance, that people ideate around you, people think at their best around you, people take ownership and share the lead around you. Okay, so that is Key number one. Key number two, 
is to admit what you don't know. Who feels like the world is moving faster than they can keep up with? Yeah, we're, we're living in a world where technology has allowed our cycles to spin so fast that we often don't even get to face the same problem twice. I did some calculations for the research I did um, for this, this book, that if you work in STEM, if you work in technology at the rate at which information is increasing and the rate at which it is decaying or evaporating, where things don't stay true for very long, my calculation was that 15% of what we know today, one five percent, 15% of what we know today is likely to be true in five years. And of course, we don't even know which 15% that, that is. Um, the most innovative people, the best leaders, make it clear what they don't know and that what they're still learning. I had this experience at Oracle that profoundly shaped me. I was working with Oracle's president, chief technology officer, and chief financial officer, and we were working on a major strategic project, the four of us, we're working on this together. And um, it wasn't going well. Their job was to shape the strategy, communicate the strategy to the company, and every time we got employees and managers together for them to say, here's where the company is going, every time we were getting the same feedback. It's not clear, it's not compelling. We don't see a clear strategy in this. Now you might not share that kind of message with your senior management, but at Oracle people were a little less respectful. And they just kept telling them, guys, you're not getting this right. And this is going on forum after forum after forum. So I start beating these guys up a little bit, saying, guys, the strategy's not clear. We need to redo this. And at one point, Jeff Henley, Oracle's chief financial officer, the company was about, what, 25, 30 billion dollars in annual revenue at the time, and he's my boss. He said to me, he goes, Liz, you can stop beating us up. We get it. And I'm like, wow, it didn't seem to me like they got it because they weren't solving this problem time after time after time. He said, Liz, we understand there's a problem. Here's the thing, though. We don't know how to do this. And I'm thinking, what is it that they don't know how to do? Communicate a strategy? Because I can help with that. He says, we've never run a company this large before. Each one of us is new to this. We don't know how to do it. It had never, ever, ever occurred to me that the senior executives didn't know how to do their jobs either. See, I thought it was just me who was struggling to keep up. See, in fast times, everybody's winging it, even the people at the top of the organization. He said, now, Liz, if you could help us learn how to do this, that would be useful. Like, Teach us how to do this and we'll figure it out. So I brought in an expert in strategy and someone who could help architect a strategy for a large multinational company. He brought in a little bit of coaching. These guys figured it out. We solved this problem, but it started when a senior executive said, we don't know how to do this. Maybe you admit, here's the things that I don't know that I'm still learning. Um, we've still got about 10 more minutes, but I'd ask everyone to pause, and if you could lock it in your head or write it down on a piece of paper or put it in your device, in your notes section, what is it that you don't know that you need to learn to be really, really good at what you do? I keep an I don't know list. I know a number of executives who keep an I don't know list. Not only to fuel our own learning, but to share with our team, here's the thing I don't know that I'm trying to learn, because it invites your whole team to help you find answers to that. Would you take 30 seconds and make a fast I don't know list? And then in the therapeutic moment, I'm gonna invite one or two of you to share what's on your I don't know list. is what if you don't know what you don't know then you should probably ask a colleague what should I learn to be really good at this 
and people will help you build that. Okay, who's got something on their I don't know list that you wouldn't mind sharing with us? Okay, I need to learn how to do macros in Word and Excel to do my job really well. Who else has got something on their I don't know list? Right here. I don't know how to communicate with my teenage kids. Yeah. I love that. Thank you. I don't know how to suck up to my superiors I don't know how to suck up to my superiors effectively. Well, there are some people who know how to do this really well. I can put you in touch with. Okay. Good. Like, okay, is there something else that's on your I don't know list? I don't know how to delegate. One more, just for fun. In the back. Yeah, she's like, I just started here. I don't know. But what I tell you, some of my research has shown that in that space of not knowing, like that's your superpower. It's temporary. Six months from now, you'll start to lose that superpower. How do we continue to operate in the space of uncertainty. Part of it is knowing what we don't know and need to learn and soliciting the help of our colleagues to help us get that. Number three, throw away your notes. Uh, there was a professor uh, at the, considered to be the top management thinker of his time. He passed eight years ago and at his memorial, this is uh, Dr. C.K. Prahalad from the University of Michigan. C.K. was not only an asset to the University of Michigan, he was a fire hazard because he was like a known fire hazard to facilities because students would line the halls just to get into an earshot of one of his lectures. Everyone knew who went to business school at Ross, which is you gotta get in C.K. Prahalad's class. At his memorial, his wife Gayatri shared something with me. She said um, one day she was going through their home office and she found a stack of handwritten notes. And she looked through and she could see these Prahalad's papers, these were his research notes. And they were precious and she pulled them out of the trash bin. She couldn't figure out how they got there. She shared them with Prahalad, and, and he said, oh, those are actually my teaching notes. And she was even happier that she had saved his teaching notes. This is like the top business school professor across like the entire US. And he said, oh yeah, I threw them away. And she was shocked, of course. And he said, I think my students deserve my best thinking and my freshest thinking every semester. Every semester he would throw away his notes. You know, what is it that you might need to throw away to make sure you deliver your freshest and best thinking? It might be standard meeting agendas, standard speeches, templates, product review, like what is it that maybe you should throw away and rebuild? Uh, surf with the amateurs. Anyone here wear any of the Hurley skate, surf, wear? Anyone here got any Hurley wear on? I talked to Bob Hurley, who built Hurley International, this global skate and surf company. He built this company really not knowing anything he was doing at the time, which for him turned out to be an incredible asset. Uh, the company is now very successful. It's part of the Nike family of brands. I asked him, Bob, how do you keep your thinking fresh and sharp? He said, well, I mean, he, Bob is just a, like a super curious, passionate kind of um, thinker. He said, yeah, I have my good days and I have my bad days. He said, I have days where I'm stuck. I can't see anything new. I don't have an innovative thought. I am like kind of dead in the water. And he says, I remember an encounter I had on Huntington Beach back in the late 70s. So Bob started out as a surfer. And he used to surf with this elite group of surfers. Now, if there are any surfers in the room, you know that there's a whole social order on the beaches, and particularly on Huntington Beach. And you don't get the yahoos just like coming down and surfing in the big waves. Who owns the big waves? The pros own the big waves. And the, like, the kids and the punks and everything, they surf over on the other side of the pier. Now, now, Bob is surfing with this group of elite surfers on the big waves on the north side of the pier. Huntington Beach, he loses his board, he goes swimming after his board, he goes under the pier, and he goes over into the small waves. And who does he see over there, hanging out with the teenagers and the kids? He sees 
a professional surfer named uh, Wayne Bartholomew. He goes by the nickname of Rabbit. He was the reigning world champion surfer at the time. Hurley sees him over there. He's like, dude, dude, what are you doing? Like, and, and he's like, hey, um, and I'm, I'm a native of California, but I can't quite get the whole surfer thing accent down. But it was something to the effect of like, dude, the waves are like righteous over here. And so he invites him to come surf with the other pros. And Rabbit says, you know, that, that, that's kind of you, mate. But I like to surf here with the kids. It's where I get my energy. And Hurley says, when I feel stuck and I can't think and I can't innovate outside of what we're doing, he says, I walk, sometimes I grab my board and I literally go down to the beach and I go surf with the kids. Not the Hurley sponsored surfers, but the kids. Or he said, or I just walk down the hall and I find the interns. The new hires, the person who's been here three weeks and says, I don't really know what I'm doing. And Hurley spends time with them and he lets their thinking and their hunger and curiosity renew him and his own thinking. Okay, we've got two more. Number five, key number five, audit your assumptions. One of the most dangerous things we do is we start to build and produce based on a set of assumptions about how our world works, what our clients need. Periodically, you might list, here are my assumptions, or as a team, here's what we assume to be true, and then go through each one of them and prosecute them. Do we have any evidence that supports this assumption? Is this still true in the world? And if it's not, cross it off and replace it with a fresh and modern assumption. Because all of our behavior and everything we produce flows from a set of assumptions. Um, and lastly, learn to see the genius in others. I think there's a lot of research available now that says the most productive teams are diverse teams. The most innovative teams are people who come at their work from a different or a diverse point of view, which means that we need to learn how to work with people who not only look differently, than we do. We need to learn to work with people who think very differently than we do. I want to share a couple pictures. Um, I mentioned I have four kids. Uh, three are what I consider to be perfectly normal human beings. Um, and then there's my son, Christian, who's just different. Um, while my three kids are all adventurous, they love doing hard fun, like they love um, roller coasters and jumping off bridges into like chilly, icy rivers. My son Christian is different, but it's not like he lacks a sense of adventure. He lacks a sense of fear. Does anyone know anyone like this? Like born without a sense of fear? Just, he, like since he's been three, he's been living his life as if Red Bull was his corporate sponsor. And you know, he lived by this motto of like, see it, climb it, figure out how to get down later, you know, figure out how to get down when you reach the summit. Um, think it, make it, clean up the mess, absolutely never. Um, he's constantly creating these like creations and messes. Everything of value in our house gets like used in one of his creations. Let me show you this picture here. Uh, this is a fort where it's where we find like our laptop and all of our equipment. It's one of his forts he created when he was about 13 years old. The problem with this fort is not what's in it, it's, it's where this thing is. <laughs> So it's easy as his mother to see this kid as a, no, 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 you're getting this all wrong. It's easy for me to see this kid as a, a constructor, no, 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 okay. Parents of teenagers, it's easy for me to look at him and see him as a, we're still on the wrong track with genius. It's easy for me to see him as a pain in the butt, thank you very much, a problem, a disaster waiting to happen, an accident, a lawsuit, a, a problem. And a few years ago, I decided that I, would choose, that I would just see him differently. And what I would do is I would look for his native genius. It's a term I use. What does he do easily and freely? What is his mind built to do? Because his mind works very differently than my mind. 
And I spent a couple years studying this and watching it. And now, how do you think I see him? I see him as a genius, like fearless, an innovator, a problem solver. But he thinks differently than me. His genius is different than mine. And as an added bonus, when he's about to do something very dangerous and totally brilliant, guess who's the first to know? Me, because he delights in showing me what he's created. Maybe you take someone on your team who you don't quite understand how their mind works, someone who thinks very differently than you, and figure out what they're brilliant at. And how do we use this person's brilliance and that person's brilliance, and how do we combine it into something kind of amazing? What could we build with a very diverse set of genius? Um, let's end, we're, we're, at, we're at the hour. Um, there's a final message I wanna share, is if we really wanna do our best innovating, we can either try to think and act like a newcomer, like a multiplier who brings out the best in others, or we can put ourselves in situations where instead of being at the top of a learning curve, where we're not always at the top of our game, we can put ourselves in new situations, saying yes to problems we don't yet know how to solve, saying yes to jobs we feel a little underqualified for, and bringing ourselves back into a place of not knowing, of asking, of operating with hunger, with utilizing the intelligence of people around us. Maybe you need to position yourself at the bottom of the learning curve. I'll leave with this video. This is um, not my daughter, this is Zia. She is 10 at the time. She's got a GoPro camera on her helmet. She is on top of the 40 meter ski jump in Park City, Utah. She's done the 20 meter before, but this is her getting herself all ready to take on the 40 meter ski jump. I think it captures what it's like when we're doing something hard and important and it tends to bring out the best in us. Okay, here we go, this is Zia. Here goes something, I guess. Okay, you can do this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump. You got it. Whoa, my ski's slipping off. Just remember, never snow plow, okay? No snow plows. Just keep it straight and you'll be fine. Do okay. Same thing you do on the 20. Straight. Do you go faster on the in run? A little bit. A little bit? Yeah. Is it any steeper, do you think? Not same, much. Same steepness, it's just longer. Well, just longer. Just longer. Just a bigger 20, that's all. Yep. Have it's fun. A bigger 20. Go ahead. You got this. I got it. Okay. Here. The longer you wait, you'll be more scared. I go. <laughs> the first time freaks you out. That's the only thing, it's so fun! Huh? 60 seems like nothing now. Whoa! I think young Zia for me captures that not only do we tend to do our best work and our best thinking when we are operating on the outer edges of what we know when we're asking questions rather than answering them from rote knowledge, it actually is also our place of greatest joy that as challenge level goes up in our work, so does our satisfaction. I have lots and lots of data that shows that. So keep you and your team on the outer edge of what you know how to do, and it'll be the place where you innovate and have the most fun doing it. So thank you, and thank you for joining me in the conversation.